Oh my god. What I'm gonna tell you is a bombshell. People are hardly seeing flying saucers anymore. You know what they see? We see this big black thing approaching. These are giant, silent, and some witnesses say incredibly fast. How would you estimate the speed? Oh, boy. What I want to know is, what are these? What the hell is that? All the videos of these things have been taken at night, until now. We have some amazing rare footage of a giant triangle shot in daylight. Where are they? It's going behind the tree now. You didn't see it? So we analyze the video, and guess what we find out? There's clearly something there. Evidence has been happening for thousands of years. A pattern. You know what this might all be about? Gold. Ufologist strikes gold. Oh, Retires well, yeah. early. These stories are great, but I need to see the evidence. It's the missing link. This is case number 93105, Giant Triangles. I want to get to the big picture of flying triangles. I've seen the evidence with my own eyes. I've seen the video. I've heard the witnesses. They can't just be earthly. Where's the proof that these things are actually alien? So there's a new guy on the team. His name is Kevin Cook. He's a mechanical engineer. He's from Philly. Now, he doesn't always agree with me. It's true. I've got my work cut out for me. They could just very well be some sort of high-tech military aircraft that nobody's seen before. Sure, a high-tech military aircraft that can both hover, stay stationary, go invisible, and shoot off at what, Mach 5, Mach 8? Come on. You know, uh, I like this guy. The similar type of thing happened before about 20 years ago when people were seeing flying triangles in the sky, and it was just a stealth bomber. The same thing could be happening again right now with a different experimental craft. It doesn't necessarily mean it's alien. Kevin's coming from that place where a lot of scientists and engineers come from. It's a, it's a place of nuts and bolts where they don't believe it unless they can actually see it. Well, you guys want evidence. That's what we're doing. We're going into a UFO hotspot that's famous for triangle UFOs. And I know it's true because I was actually there a couple years ago where I met with the sky watcher who actually videotaped one of these daylight triangles while I was there. So you saw it? Yeah. Well, no, I didn't see the triangle, but I was with a guy who videotaped the triangle when it happened. So I know the phenomenon is real. This is gonna be a challenge. There's not a lot of physical evidence that I can get my hands on here. I'm working mostly with these theories that Bill and Pat are throwing out. Somebody needs to make sure that they don't go over the edge and they stay grounded in reality. We will hear things that will convince even the most die-hard skeptics that flying triangles are real, that there's an alien connection that's unmistakable, and I suspect we may even discover why they're here. If we can show him what we know to be true, what the documents say, what the witnesses say, what the video says, if we can get him to see that for what it is, we may actually have a real scientific edge to our entire investigation. We are in the grips of an unusual phenomenon. All over the world, people have been seeing giant triangles. The most famous, Belgium, 1989. Phoenix, Arizona, 1997. Tinley Park, Illinois, 2004. All of them at night. But now new breaks in the investigation of these unexplained triangular craft. We've uncovered rare, never before seen daytime footage taken in an area of California known as Triangle Alley. There's three lights in triangular formation, um, very bright. They're massive. They're flying so slowly over us that if it were a conventional aircraft, we'd fall out of the sky. So we are going to talk to Mark and Jed, two sky watchers here in Sonora, California, who've had some incredible daytime and nighttime sightings of flying triangles. 
It was June 15, 2004, when I was here on that balcony right there with you. We were looking at the sky up there, and you videotaped a, a real triangle during daylight hours. Oh my God. I've got three lights in a triangular formation. Are you sure? Yes, this is, this is, this is, oh my God. I was right there next to him, and I was, I, you know, I was fumbling with my camera, but by the time I got everything up and running, uh, this thing was gone. You missed it. I, I missed it, unfortunately, but Mark was there, and I'm telling you guys, this really happened. Pat's telling me he missed it, which makes me wonder if what he saw was even a UFO, or maybe it was just a plane. Now, this is Kevin's first investigation, so I understand that he's skeptical. You know, I'm a little nervous because this is the first time in our years of investigating UFOs that I was actually at a sighting. I'm personally invested in this, and, and I'd be really embarrassed if this turns out to be nothing but a small airplane. And these lights, they were equidistant. It seemed like it was from one solid figure. Yes, and they didn't vary as they moved across the sky. They stayed fixed. What the hell is that? Are you sure? It's behind those branches. You didn't see it? Oh my god. The lights did not move away from each other. They were equidistant. All I could think of is this is not of this world. These UFOs originated back behind this ridge. Are you aware of any Air Force bases, uh, maybe just an airport? Over on the other side of this ridge is Columbia Airport. It's a very small airport. They don't even have radar. What about military? Uh, the only military base is Castle over in Merced, and it's closed. Well, people might be tempted to ask, why is it that you both see so many UFOs? I've watched for literally thousands of hours for a few minutes of footage. This was more than just a hobby. Oh, for a while there, it became an obsession almost, just what? wanting to know what they are. Sounds like it paid off. Sort of, yeah, I want to know. I still don't know what they are. I still want to find but out. We have daytime footage. That's yes. just so incredibly rare. I hope it uh, can be analyzed and independently and so we can see what these are. I know that Kevin doesn't buy this, but, but I was there and we captured something amazing. I know Pat thinks this is real, but I need something more than witness testimony and, and consumer grade video. We need to analyze this footage to see what it really is. The Mark Olson video is really interesting, not just for what it is, but because it's so reminiscent of the video shot in Belgium in 1989. Both the Olsen video and the Belgium video were three lights in a triangular formation. But the Belgium video was even more compelling than the Olsen video because the Belgium video actually showed a physical object holding the three lights in place, a triangle. I believe that if Terence Masson has a chance to analyze this Mark Olsen video, what he's gonna see is an object holding the three lights together. That's our next stop. Terrace Masson's lab. Terrence Masson is an image analyst, and he'll be using motion tracking software to isolate and stabilize the three lights in Mark Olson's daytime footage. We're going to analyze Mark's video frame by frame to get some answers. So what I've done here first is cropped out the majority of the frame so we can concentrate on the object itself and stabilized it. You can tell definitively here, these things are rock solid in formation. This is a good solid four and a half seconds, and even the tightest precision acrobatic flying, you're gonna see some kind of relative motion over that kind of time frame. Can we eliminate the obvious things? Is this some type of helicopter? Is there any evidence of that? Well, without having 100% certainty, I can come up with a long list of things that make this not anything like conventional aircraft. Going away from the running footage now, we've got single still frames, isolated, and I've run some image processing routines on this. And look at what's coming. We see some clear indication of a structure behind and between those three lights. Whoa. And black triangle. I mean, there's clearly something there. Is there any other explanation that the darkness around these lights is something other than a solid object? Many times we've seen in these consumer-grade camcorders, 
the uh, exposure range for the pixels that capture this information are very, very limited, and sometimes we do get uh, blooming effects. Uh, so next to very bright lights, it'll tend to compensate and go very right. dark. Right. That's not what we're seeing here. It's too consistent over too long of footage. What's your best guess? What are we looking at? <laughs> My best guess would be we're looking at a single triangular-shaped dark craft with three very large either propulsion or illuminating lights. Um, that's not consistent with any man-made craft. We're heading up the Lions Bald Mountain, which is right in the heart of Triangle Alley and the ideal location to hopefully see what Mark Olson filmed. This Triangle Alley actually extends for 350 miles around the Sierra Nevada Mountains, from here in Sonora, California, heart of the Gold Rush country, to, to further up north at Mount Shasta. I'll be honest with you. Yeah. I'm really anxious to look in the sky for UFOs, but I'm more concerned about keeping my footing on these rocks. There's a lot of loose rock, it's steep, there's snow on the ground, and we're carrying heavy packs full of gear. Now, Pat, he's the wilderness guy. Me, I'm more comfortable in the city, so this is a bit more of an adventure than I anticipated. Well, if this spot is as hot as Mark says it is, there's a good chance we might actually see something. A lot of people say UFOs don't exist, but uh, they're the same people who never actually come out and, and watch the skies themselves. So we're gonna take a crack at it and we're gonna spend the night out here and see if we see something. What do you think about this spot it's right here? a good here? spot. Well, here's the ridge. That's the silver mine. If we're gonna see anything, it's gonna be from right here. I don't think you can get hotter than uh, this place right here. So let's set up the camera and maybe you take the GPS readings. Yeah. Right now, Kevin's pounding in a marker that will take a GPS reading. All set. So that in the future, we can look back at our records and know exactly where we were should we see a triangle tonight. North, 38 degrees, 7 minutes, 50.2 seconds. West, 120 degrees, 5 minutes, 45.6 seconds. Great. Good. Got it. We are in the right place. This is where witnesses report seeing a flying craft Triangle Alley, it's right here. If we do catch something on camera, it's done right. We have the right camera set up and we'll be able to analyze it very well. That is our goal. I was just looking at the stars and all of a sudden I see this shape. It's kind of like... We've been on top of the mountain in the middle of Triangle Alley, and we've been watching the sky all night long. What we were hoping to find up here is, is actual proof of these flying triangles, something we can see with our own eyes and capture on film. I honestly think that we should be focusing most of our attention along the horizon instead of up high. Because most of the witness reports having them coming from behind a ridge and then disappearing behind a ridge just over the course of seconds. If we see something moving, I think our eyes will be drawn to it automatically. I hope so. It's dark out here, and it's by far the coldest night I've ever spent looking for UFOs. One thing's for sure, your mind definitely plays tricks on you. Do you see that light just above the ridge? It goes white, then red. Yeah, I see it. Are we on to something? So we found something in the sky, and we don't know what it is. It's bright, it seems to be moving very slowly. Possibly it's a star. It looks like it might be moving. I'm not too sure. Well, it's uh, right above the ridge. It seems to be flickering. I think it's a star that's coming up over the ridge. OK, well, I got something actually on my, my phone, a little application that uh, has a star map on it. And it'll tell us what that little star is, if that is a star. Tell me what it is. So let me calibrate here. We're looking at Orion here. So let's bring it down here. and. Uh, Let's see what it says. And according to this, that star could be Pollux. We've been out here most of the night, and we've seen some things. But so far, they've just been airplanes and satellites and stars. Our eyes are playing tricks on us. So I can totally see how people can get really excited from things they see in the sky that are just casually explained.
multiple triangular shaped objects have been reported in this general area. These objects were in view of multiple witnesses. What these things can do is just uh, amazing, just amazing. I'm going to meet with Ruben Uriarte, MUFON's Northern California State Director. He has been researching the history of UFOs in this area and has developed one of the most comprehensive databases available. We're going to get the really big picture of flying triangles, what they are and who's flying them. We've been getting so many reports of, of sightings, um, an increased spike of triangles especially. We consider it like an intersection to what we call Triangle Alley, which is from Southern California all the way up to the Washington border. Nevada's right next door. We have Area 51, which is approximately 260 miles away. Tonopah Air Force Base, another black budget base possibly 200 miles away. So the Nevada test site is only about 250 miles away. That's like the blink of an eye for some of the multiple Mark supersonic aircraft we have. In Triangle Alley, there have been over 60 reported sightings of Triangle UFOs only since the year 2000. This is a huge number of sightings for such a sparsely populated region. Imagine the number of sightings that have gone unreported. Here's a triangle. Now, this is 1986, Bill. This is before they released the B-2 bomber. Obviously, the characteristics are a lot different. They're huge. Uh, this thing went right over a freeway, four lanes in width. So where was this? Where this was this, this is a further north up here in near Corny. What's really interesting is this thing was just hovering. And the witnesses actually observed in detail, as you can see, uh, over half an hour. This craft in Corning is similar to hundreds of other videos we've seen right here in Triangle Alley. It's three lights, three lights that may look separate, but they're in this rigid configuration with each other. They hover silently in the sky. Then they shoot off at tremendous speeds. We've got to find out what is the link among all these different craft. This reminds me of Phoenix. Yes. I, all the same characteristics that we keep hearing about. You know, they're large, they're silent. They make no sound whatsoever. Lights around the perimeter. The lights illuminated the object. Major light in the center. Mm -hmm. Lit up as bright as day. When you compare planes to this, when you compare helicopters to this, they look, they behave entirely differently. How long have these been going on? It goes back probably in the, the great airship sightings back in 1896, 1897 from San Francisco to Sacramento all the way to Stockton around the general vicinity. There was reports from miners that were working and seeing strange objects, strange stars. The other thing that's unique about this area, Bill, is there's a large cavernous system that stretches throughout the state, particularly right here in this area for several hundred miles up toward the Shasta area. This area is loaded with minerals. Um, you know, it's gold country. When he said gold country, I stopped in my tracks. Gold? Could it be that simple? Whoever or whatever is flying these triangles could be interested in gold. We've been focusing a lot on extraterrestrial, but perhaps the other answer to this whole mystery is inner Earth. Gold has a very, very high conductivity. We use gold in circuits. So we should be looking down at the same time we're looking up. And, and if we find something there, that can actually possibly draw UFOs to it. I consider Sonora like the intersection. It's a beacon here. Here's what we know. It's not just Sonora, it's the entire Sierra Nevada range. It's not just flying triangles, it's all sorts of objects. It's not just now, it's 100 years. Maybe it's the gold in these hills that's been attracting flying triangles for well over 100 years. So my concern is that tomorrow's headlines will be ufologists trapped in mine after earthquake. Yeah. Think that's possible? You got it all wrong. Headline's gonna be ufologist strikes gold. Oh. Retires well, yeah. early. We're on our way to an actual working gold mine here in the Motherload region of Northern California. This sits right in the path of where Mark Olson had his sighting. We'll be testing for high levels of radiation and magnetism, invisible energies that might attract UFOs to this region. 
Oh, okay. Looks like that's it right there. Sweet. We have a magnetometer and a Geiger counter, and we're gonna look for anything out of the ordinary. You think we'll find anything? I actually do expect to get some readings, at least for the magnetometer. We should get, pick up some magnetic fields from iron. To tell you the truth, I'm excited that this is a gold mine. I'm very excited. However, my entire life, I've been purposefully trying to stay out of small places like caves and whatnot, so I am a little bit nervous. Ready? It's a little bit smaller than I expected. But as long as I stay focused on the task at hand, everything's gonna be fine. Oh, man. Why am I thinking about bats? I'm here meeting with my good friend, fellow publisher, Giorgio Sukalas. I've got this knowing feeling that there's something we're missing. There's something in flying triangles that goes all the way back to ancient times. I've actually got something that might make your triangle mystery a bit less mysterious. This artifact like here was actually found in Colombia and it's pre-Columbian and about a dozen of these have been found and to the untrained eye, this looks like a fighter jet. Mainstream archeologists and mainstream science basically says that this is nothing but a stylized insect or a stylized bird. From a biological perspective, wings on a bird are exactly where we have our arms. They're attached to the shoulder girdle. In this example right here, the wings are not attached to the shoulder girdle. So biologically speaking, this is not a bird. The one thing that is extremely interesting here is the upright tail fin. Birds do not have upright tail fins. Their tail fins are horizontal. This is incredible. Giorgio is actually showing me representational artwork of triangular shapes that the ancients used as talismans. How would a Colombian culture from 1,500 years ago even understand aerodynamically what a tail fin does, right? Unless they saw something, but they couldn't explain it entirely. And so not only did they put a whole bunch of stuff in writing, but they also recreated stuff that they said, you know, our heirs should be able to look at these things so that we don't forget what has happened during their time. Can you say it? It's the missing link between the ancient's vision yes. of flying triangles in the sky and our vision of what flying triangles can be and what we've actually reversed engineered for our own aircraft. Either people is, from another world came here with those, or even more stunning, somebody was time traveling. It's been a long time that I've had doubts about whether there were UFOs or aliens visiting us from outer space. Right over the roof, I saw three red lights in a very small triangle. And it was coming pretty fast, and the triangle was getting bigger. From what I saw, I don't think that anyone on this planet has the technology right now to be able to do that. This is the mother load. In the last 20, 30 years, I've probably investigated 400 sightings. I'm just trying to figure out why they're here. It's a little bit more narrow than I expected. Yeah, pretty low, too. We're in California gold country to investigate the theory that aliens are mining our gold to use as an electrical conductor to power their craft. If it's true, we should find high levels of radiation and magnetism trace evidence which has been found at the scene of several UFO landings. All right, let's go. We're traveling down this mine, and I have to admit I'm a little bit nervous. It's dark, it's narrow, and I'm willing to bet that there are bats in here. Well, this looks like the end of the mine right here. This is as far as it goes. This, is, this will be perfect. Let's start with the Geiger counter, and then work with the magnetometer. Look for anything unusual. 
A Geiger counter measures the number of radioactive samples detected per minute, and standard atmospheric radiation levels are about 15 counts per minute. Now, ufologists claim that uh, abnormally high levels of radiation are a residual effect of UFO contact. Now, if there are high levels of radiation in there, I think it's safe to say we're not going to be hanging out for very long. Are you getting something? No, everything seems normal. Not much deviation from normal atmospheric radiation. Now, in the mine, we detected nothing abnormal, nothing that was any different from standard atmospheric radiation levels. So next, we're going to try using a magnetometer, which measures the changes in a magnetic field in the mine. And it's reported that UFOs are actually attracted to high levels of magnetism. I'm getting anything from zero to five milligauss on the magnetometer. And is it just jumping around, or is it consistent in one place? It's, it's jumping around. Just like the Geiger counter, the magnetometer readings were all normal. This gold mine is dry. Just because gold is one of the best conductors of electricity, that's not proof that aliens are coming here to get it. So a number of experts have hypothesized that there is a connection between uh, heavy mineral deposits, particularly gold, and, and UFO activity. It's just a theory. You're smiling at me like I'm yeah. insane. <laughs> what do you think? Am I, am I nuts? Pat's suggesting that UFOs are, are actually hovering above the mountains and, and somehow extracting the resources they need from the mountains themselves. That just sounds like Star Trek to me. I'd much rather focus on the Geiger counter and the magnetometer and looking for any unusual readings than thinking about Pat's unusual theory. If there are beings from another planet and they wanted resources, uh, I, could, I could see it being sensical that they would actually come here and just take ours. They don't even have to fight us. Still, it's just a theory. Exactly, but uh, you know, one that's worthy of investigation, don't you think? That's why we're here. That's what's exciting about this investigation. You get a lot of leads, some will take you to a dead end, and some take you into a gold mine. While you guys were out in the field, I was meeting with Giorgio Tsoukalos. He showed me a replica of an artifact of a flying triangle. These carvings were found in caves. They were found throughout South America. And this is basically, what, 1,000 years old, 1,500 years old. Legend has it that these types of craft were flown by ancient astronauts. We don't know where they came from. We don't know who they are. We don't know if they're from the future, they're from another planet. We just don't know. You're telling me that 1,500 years ago, there were aircraft in the sky flying around, and people were making models of them and drawing them, making little trinkets just like this? Indigenous peoples on planet Earth were visited by ancient astronauts flying craft just like this, triangular-shaped craft, visiting planet Earth and seeding the culture with information. A possibility? It could also be a time ship. Oh. Bill says that these ancient astronauts are actually time ships from the future. I mean, come on, time traveling, it, it just doesn't exist, at least not today. This is just science fiction. Flying triangles from the future, from our future, going back in time. They see them, they're seeding the past, and they did something, maybe something religious, maybe something cultish, we don't know. Time traveling, you're talking about time traveling here. Some sort of vehicle traveling from the future into the past, that's it? Is there any kind of proof behind this, or is this simply a theory? I'm telling you that 20 years ago, an army officer traveled into the future. We have that totally documented. Is there proof that these ships are coming back from the future? No. I have to say, this is why I love Bill. He doesn't hold back. A hundred years ago, people laughed at the idea that we would be able to fly in airplanes. People laughed at Charles Darwin for uh, proposing the theory of evolution. So, uh, you know, when Bill Burns proposes the theory of time travel, uh, I don't think I can laugh it off. Regardless what inspired the design of this trinket, it is a triangle, and it does look like it might be aerodynamic. I propose that we make a model identical to this right here, out of styrofoam or something like that. Just throw it in the air like a glider, see if it flies. You got it. Sounds good. It's been a long time that I've had doubts about whether there were UFOs or aliens visiting us from outer space. From what I saw, I don't think that 
anyone on this planet has the technology right now to be able to do that. We are now in Houston, Texas, about to meet with a pilot with over 40 years of experience. He saw a triangle in the sky that he still can't explain. And what exactly is your background in flying? Well, I have 40 years of flying, both military and commercially. I've flown probably 25 or 30 different airplanes. Pilots make excellent witnesses. These are professionals that are trained to observe the sky. When a pilot sees something and he doesn't know what it is flying through the sky, we have to give it special consideration. It was the 18th of May, 1996, and uh, it was about 1.20. I caught something out of my eye and I just looked off to the left like that and right over the roof I saw three red lights and a very small triangle and it was coming pretty fast and the triangle was getting bigger. It was almost like it was might have been climbing a little bit because it didn't follow the curvature of the earth. It just disappeared into infinity. How would you estimate the speed? Oh boy. I've seen the Sputnik and watch it for quite a while. I know the SR-71 and believe me, uh, even a 71 couldn't go as fast as that. Mike Dasick has seen the SR-71 in person. This is the fastest airplane ever built. It goes up to speeds of Mach 3 plus, that's 2,400 miles per hour. And what Mike Dasick saw in the sky was much faster than that. It's really hard for me to imagine that this experienced pilot with more than 30 years in the cockpit uh, would not be able to identify the SR-71. Did you have any special training in identifying foreign aircraft or enemy aircraft? Oh yeah, that was part of your training. You had these black silhouettes that flash them up on the screen and you would just say P-51, F-15. You didn't want to be shooting down your own airplanes. What you saw that night was not one of the silhouettes you saw in your training. Oh, absolutely not. No, no way. It's very exciting talking to Mike because he's a trained expert in identifying foreign and enemy aircraft. And when he says he doesn't know what's flying up there, I have to believe him. This was a genuine, unidentified triangle, and he says it's not ours. Well, what would you say it was today? For the first time in my life, I really think that I saw something very unusual. I might not have believed before that there were aliens visiting with us, but now I, I believe there are. I honestly don't know what's going on. Before hearing this testimony, I was leaning towards these flying triangles being military aircraft. But now I don't know what to think. Since our investigation into triangle UFOs, we've received hundreds of emails from people who have seen these craft. Among them was Gordon Scott, who witnessed a huge black triangle flying along the creek bed behind his home. Now he was reluctant to appear before the cameras, but he's reached a comfort level with us and is now agreeing to come forward and speak about what he saw. When we first saw this thing going down the creek, we were scared to death. We are getting ready to call 911. This took place in 2001, August 15th at about 8.30 p.m. We run out to our backyard and we see this big black thing approaching. The bright red light on the bottom lit up the whole creek, probably 100 feet across. And I assumed it was an aircraft ditching. I could have hit it with a softball underhanded. That's how close you were? That's how close. What kind of noise did you hear? Nothing. Did you feel any heat? Did you feel no. any breeze? No. Did you smell anything? No. He was so close to this giant triangle, yet he heard nothing. He smelled nothing. He felt nothing. Not a breeze, and not a hum, nothing at all. I find it kind of suspect. He was so close, and this was such a large object. Then where did it go? Followed the creek, stayed at the lowest point possible, went right over here to the base of the bridge, and it just went vertical like this, over the bridge, about 15 feet above it, maybe 20, then it dropped right back down in the creek. It's moving horizontally, and it's moving vertically. As far as I know, we don't have any technology today that can do that. But to tell you the truth, I wouldn't be surprised to find out that we do. Within about five minutes, we had an F-16. That was flying very slow, gear up. It was fully armed. It had two sidewinders on the wings. It had two more uh, missiles underneath. 
Minutes after sighting this strange flying triangle, Gordon saw an F-16, which tells me that there's some kind of military involvement with this craft. Either the government knows what these triangles are and is involved with them, or these flying triangles are completely out of our control and do not belong to our government, and we are monitoring their activity. It wasn't chasing the black triangle. I believe it to be an escort. It was flying with it. Now, we got NASA just down the road. It's not that far from here. So it Is NASA been going in the there. direction where the thing was heading? Yes. Came from the north, it was headed to the south. 30 miles east of Gordon Scott's house is Johnson Space Center, home to NASA. What does it mean that an F-16 is following this giant triangle towards NASA? So guys, what do you think about some of these cases that we've been hearing? I would say both of them are baffling. Gordon Scott, to me, obviously kind of seems like a military aircraft. Just flying low, F-16 guiding it. There's a lot of things that point to that. What if it's some kind of cooperative hybrid craft that we're developing with ET? Actually working with extraterrestrials to build these flying triangles. Actually working with extraterrestrial technology, not with extraterrestrials on board, but with their technology, kind of Area 51 reverse engineering. What if we've been doing that for years? Well, Bill has a theory that uh, aliens and humans are, are collaborating on, on creating this reverse engineered technology. I think we have to be careful about how far we want to go with these, these theories that uh, aliens are, are working with us secretly. Until I can find some kind of definite proof, I'm afraid Bill's alone on this one. I mean, we're just trying to figure out if these are military or extraterrestrial. I, I, I think that going all the way to hybrid already is, is, uh, is kind of jumping the gun a little bit, don't you think? Why? It's been going on since World War II. I need something to hold on to. Where is the evidence? I mean, it's great in theory. It could be. It could be the case. These could all be extraterrestrial, but I don't have the, the proof that I need to prove that, other than their weird flight characteristics. I just think we have to keep our, our speculation in check. I mean, we really don't have proof that there are alien craft that we are reverse engineering. The proof is what Gordon Scott saw. He saw something that, given your description, of what people have been talking about behave like nothing we've ever developed. It's what do you not, need? It's not what so far out that it, it is conceivable that we could actually have these kinds of crap. I wouldn't be surprised to find out we do have this technology, the type of thing that Gordon Scott saw today. Let's go see Brick. We're about to meet with special effects artist and coordinator Brick Price. Brick has modeled the relic that Giorgio gave us the other day. And we're gonna find out, is that object really fly? We're wondering, will this fly? Can this fly? Given the shapes, I would say so, definitely. <laughs> There's no question in my mind. Just from looking at this, you're already convinced that this is some sort of aircraft, it's aerodynamic, and it's going to fly. There's too many things about the shape that, that, that I think represent flight in our time. Well, it looks like you changed your model from the original a little bit. It looks like it's streamlined. Did you make any changes to the angle of attack on the wing or the distance, the, the height, the weight, the center of gravity? What kind of changes did you make? None. None? No. Talking to Brick, I fully expected that he was going to say we needed to make some changes to this model in order to get it to fly properly. We needed to change the angle of the wing. We needed to change the distance here, the distance there, the center of gravity. But he didn't. He didn't need to change anything. This thing apparently flies on its own. I can't wait to see it. One thing that's interesting about it is that, that this, the wing is swept area, is taken up a lot by the body, but the body has a shape to it like a lifting body, which means that the, wing, the body itself actually acts as a uh, lifting surface. The structure of the body is actually a lifting body. It's comparable to the angle of an aircraft wing, which means while it's in flight, it's actually creating lift to lift the entire object. What this means is that this artifact seems to be designed and optimized as a glider so it can go through the air with minimal propulsion. As aerodynamic as it is, and it, maybe it flies as well as you're saying, it just, it's too perfect. That's what makes me a believer. <laughs> the object, triangular shape, we saw windows along one side of it, and it just glided by. No sound, absolutely no sound. We were at the lab of special effects supervisor Brick Price in Los Angeles, California, 
who has made an exact scale model of Giorgio's artifact. If this model flies, we can have our final piece of proof that alien visitation has been going on for thousands of years. All right, launch away. Let's see this thing fly. Okay. If the model actually flies, then we really have to reconsider what we believe about uh, ancient civilizations and what they knew. And it's possible that uh, they had knowledge of aerodynamics, of, of flying machines, and, and maybe, um, you know, maybe extraterrestrial craft. Oh, oh look yes. at that. That's fantastic. Oh. Ah, that okay. flew. It's starting to lift. It's starting to lift. That's good. That no. flew a lot better than I wanted it to. <laughs> I'm sorry, Kevin. Sorry. Wow. This model flew and did a lot better than I ever expected. And I kind of have a conflict. I wasn't sure that this was actually modeled after a real aircraft. Now, I don't know what to think. The relic flies. Not only does it fly, the inherent aerodynamic qualities of this are so intense that it stalls, rights itself, and settles down. We're looking at proof of ancient flying triangles. This design is made to form that angle of attack just like the way the space shuttle comes down exactly. for its landing. Exactly right. I also think it's interesting that it didn't dive at all. No. It didn't it's dive, exactly it didn't right. flip. It didn't go up it in the air and come back down on its tail. When we saw this thing in flight, its tail dropped, its nose went up, and it settled down to gather the lift. Quite frankly, this mimics the space shuttle's design. But you ask yourself, how could the indigenous peoples living in Colombia 1,500 years ago have conceived of a device like this, a gliding device? There's one answer, which is implausible, but more plausible than anything else. Time travel. You've got to be impressed of the aerodynamics of this design. No, I can't deny it. And if that is the exact replica of what Giorgio gave us the other day, that tells you a lot about what they saw. Something from outer space? Possible. I, there's nothing that points to that, in my opinion. I'm leaning towards that these ancient artifacts, these little trinkets, are modeled after some sort of highly advanced aerodynamic toy. And that's all this is. What's with Kevin Cook? I mean, he's watching this thing fly, and even as it's landing perfectly, he's doubting the significance of what we've shown. What is he saying? doesn't show anything, doesn't show there were ancient astronauts, doesn't show flying triangles were flying over South America 2,000 years ago, doesn't show anything. Hello. I wish Bill would take the time to think about what this test actually proves. It has nothing to do with airships in the sky from the future, from another planet. All it says is that there was an understanding way back when of aerodynamics, and that's special enough in itself. Well, I'll tell you what this means to me. It means that somehow long ago, uh, some ancient peoples came up with a design that's perfectly aerodynamic. How they came up with that idea, I, I really can't say. And I, I, there's no way we can conclude that. But it opens up possibilities. Were those people seeing the same triangular craft that we're seeing today? Well, now we have to be open to that possibility. So here's what we found out. People all over the world are seeing these giant triangles. Pilots tell us they are capable of speeds and maneuvers more advanced than anything out there. And we have proof that ancient peoples may have seen something similar. This is one huge piece of the puzzle. But there's more. We've just got this amazing footage of triangles shot less than 100 miles from where we were in Triangle Alley. 